Hello Internet. Every now and then we get some great coincidences in this universe and things just happen to line up. In this case, we're talking about Jupiter, Saturn and the December solstice. So on the longest day of the year for the Southern Hemisphere and the longest night of the year for the Northern Hemisphere, the two largest planets in our solar system are going to appear to turn into one from the naked eye. And this will be the greatest great conjunction in 400 years. A great conjunction is where Jupiter and Saturn appear to become close to each other in the sky. Of course, they're still a long way away from each other, but from our perspective, they can line up in their orbits and appear very close to each other in our sky. And this year, they're going to be so close that with the unaided eye, they may just look like a single star. This video will be a detailed guide on how to enjoy this exciting event from three different perspectives. Each perspective will have its own part in this video. The first part is for visual observers and anyone wanting to experience this event visually. Then we'll be talking about some wide field options for if you have a DSLR and a lens like this, and we'll be going over some ideas of how to capture this event with a moderate to wide field lens. And finally, we'll be finishing off with narrow field imaging. And that is designed for those of you with telescopes, say one like this, larger or smaller, or any other narrow field optics. You can check down the description below for links to each of those parts of this video so that you can jump around and view the part that you are most interested in. I will also be streaming this event on the 21st, so make sure you're subscribed if you'd like to watch this event live with me through this telescope. So starting off with visual observing, I'm going to break visual observing down into three subsections. Unaided, lightly aided, and heavily aided. Now, what do I mean by aided? Well, any item that improves your eye's ability to see, say like binoculars or a telescope, or even a optical or digital zoom on a camera. If you're going to be viewing this conjunction unaided or lightly aided, I would highly recommend that you download a sky guide app on your phone. There are a huge number of these apps out there now, but they do a great job at guiding you around the night sky. One of my favorites is called sky guide on iOS, but Stellarium and heavens above are two great options for Android as well. Again, you can find links for these down in the description. As you can see here, there are, these apps are really powerful and allow you to find a huge amount of information for what's going on in this night sky, as well as being able to direct you to objects that you would like to see. So in this case, they will easily help you find Jupiter and Saturn during the Great Conjunction. If you're going to be viewing this conjunction unaided, then you will want to look to the southwest shortly after sunset and find the very bright looking star that will be about yay high above the horizon. This will be Jupiter and Saturn. These planets will then set about two hours after sunset, so it will only really be visible for about an hour and a half because it will take some time after the sun has set for them to start becoming visible. The sun is just too bright and will outshine these to the naked eye during the day. So the best time to view this will be from about 20 minutes after sunset through to about two hours after sunset, in which case they will reach the horizon. Of course, you'll want to make sure there is nothing tall in the westerly view because that will easily obstruct these. They will fall beneath the tree line quite quickly after the sun has set. Here you can see a simulated view of this in Stellarium from both the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. If you are using some light optics to help you view this event, then you can use the same techniques as in the unaided section to find Jupiter and Saturn. And from there, depending on how much magnification the optics you are using will give you, you should be able to see some shape to Saturn. It will appear oval rather than completely circular, and that is due to its rings. You should also be able to make out Jupiter's four brightest moons, called the Galilean moons. Now once again here, we have a simulated view through Stellarium of what this will look like with a 50 times magnification through some binoculars. As you can see here, you can make out Saturn and Jupiter as distinct planets, as well as four of Jupiter's largest moons in this orientation, and possibly even two of Saturn's moons, depending on how dark your skies are at the time. So now let's talk about viewing this conjunction with heavy visual aids. If you have a telescope like this or another high magnification device, then you will be best suited to viewing the fine details of this conjunction event. 
In planetary viewing, aperture is king to make out the most detail possible in the planets, their surfaces, and the moons. It will also help you to keep images brighter as you increase magnification. Unfortunately, during this event, the planets will be low on the horizon, which will greatly reduce the amount of surface detail that we'll be able to see. It is important if you're using high-powered optics that you reduce the amount of turbulence in the atmosphere between you and the planets as much as possible. Now, traditionally, the best viewing is straight up in the sky, but unfortunately, as these planets will be low, we'll be looking through a large amount of atmosphere, which will hinder our ability. However, there are still a few things that we can do to make the best out of this situation. Firstly, you will want to get as high up as possible. And by high up, I mean altitude. If you have any hills or mountains near you, then that will definitely help as it'll get you above a little bit of atmosphere, no matter how small that atmosphere amount may be. Secondly, you want to make sure there is as little as possible between you and the Western horizon. This means if you can, make sure there are no buildings or cities or anything like that as they will add a lot of pollution and grit to the sky, which will obscure your view. Objects like concrete, asphalt, and roofing, etc., heat up during the day, and then during the night, they radiate that heat out into the atmosphere. The atmosphere then heats up, rises, and this causes a lot of heat turbulence. Like looking down a road during the peak of summer and you see that heat coming off it, this will greatly reduce the view that you have of these planets. So ideally, make sure that you're set up in a park or with a lot of nature to your west so that you don't have to deal with a huge amount of that turbulence. Now let's talk about field of view and magnification and what level of these you should be aiming for to view this conjunction to the best of its ability. The two planets will be very close to each other so we can really use quite a high power to view this event. However, keep in mind that the seeing or viewing quality of the atmosphere may limit your magnification to lower than what is theoretically possible and what we'll be talking about soon. Each telescope has its own maximum useful magnification. So please check that before trying to view at extreme magnifications as you may try and push your telescope more than it is capable and that will simply lead to bad views. So if you find that as you increase the magnification, your views get worse, it will be better to view with a moderate magnification with detail than a high magnification that is too dark or blurry because you have pushed your telescope beyond its apertures. At the applause of this event, you can go as deep as 10 arc minutes or 0.71 degrees field of view. This is before you start clipping any of the major moons of the two planets. So really, we can get crazy tight with this one. However, how do you find out how to get that field of view with your telescope and eyepieces. To start, we need to calculate the magnification of each eyepiece you have and how that interacts with your telescope. To do this, we divide the focal length of your telescope by the focal length of your eyepiece. In this case, I'll be using the Teleview Delos 10, which is a 10 millimeter focal length eyepiece. So I take the 1000 millimeter focal length of this telescope divide it by the 10 millimeter focal length of this eyepiece, and we end up with a hundred times magnification. Now that we know this, we can work out the true field of view. Each eyepiece has a different field of view. This depends on the way that your eyepiece is built and how much field of view the designers wanted that eyepiece to have. It usually costs more to get an eyepiece with a larger field of view because the designers have to create glass that is wider and larger to give you that more apparent field of view. However, the true field of view is a combination of the field of view of your eyepiece with the magnification that you are looking at. In this case, you divide the apparent field of view that your eyepiece gives by the magnification that you have with your eyepiece and your telescope combination. In this case, this eyepiece has a 72 degree field of view. So we take 72, divide it by 100, and we end up with 0 0.72 degrees field of view. Now, 0 0.72 degrees field of view is reasonably narrow. To give you an example, the moon is about half a degree field of view. So this eyepiece with this telescope in combination allows me to see the entire moon with a little bit of sky around it in one view. However, that is still much larger than the 0 0.17 degree field of view that these two planets will be taking up. So for me, if I was using this eyepiece, I would want to further cut down my field of view. Now I can either do that by changing my eyepiece to an eyepiece that has a smaller field of view, 
but that will simply allow me to see, view a smaller piece of sky. What I really would like to do is increase the magnification that I will be using, which will make those planets larger in the same field of view looking through the eyepiece. The best way to do this is to use a Barlow or a Palmate. Now, if you're into photography, you may know these by a different word, which is a teleconverter. A two times Barlow will then double your magnification. So instead of having 72 degrees divided by 100, we would have 72 degrees divided by 200, which would end up in around 0.36 degrees. And now we're starting to get a little bit closer. So for this eyepiece and telescope combination, I could actually go all the way up to a five times Barlow or Palmate if I wanted to. And that would mean that I would just start to clip some of the moons. However, I wouldn't recommend going that high because doing so, you will definitely start to run into some atmospheric issues that will limit the quality of your seeing. However, if you have a telescope larger than this and you have an incredibly still sky and perhaps you are on top of a mountain, then please do feel free to start going up to 500 times or so magnification and see how this looks for you. That is it for the visual part of this video. Next up, let's talk about wide field. So if you have a camera and a wide to moderate lens, maybe something like this, then you may struggle to get enough detail to discern the two planets during this great conjunction. In this part of the video, I'll go over three of my wide field ideas to help you capture this conjunction best. If your weather forecast looks to be clear before, a few days before and after the conjunction, then I think a great way to capture this conjunction would be through a multi-day time-lapse. To do this, simply set up your camera on a tripod, take your camera to the same location at the same time every day, point it at the planets and make sure your framing is the same and your zoom is the same, and then take a photo every day, a couple before and a couple days after the conjunction, and turn those into a video time-lapse. This will show the motion of the two planets as Jupiter catches up with Saturn and overtakes them, which I think would look very cool. Here's a quick simulation of how this view will look. Another option is for you to do the same, but just in the one night, tracking the path that they trace across the sky from sunset until they set in the horizon two hours later. This could also work if you own a star tracker, which will help you pull out the stars and other deep space objects around the planets. In fact, on the 21st, they will actually be quite close to M75, which is a reasonably bright globular star cluster. So if you have a dark sky to your west, then you should definitely be able to make out this globular cluster with even a moderate lens. My final idea is one that has endless opportunities within it. Since these two planets will be so close to the horizon, it's the perfect opportunity to, have some, to add some creativity and position objects on the ground or people so that they are interacting with the two planets. Since these two planets will be extremely bright in the sky, you will easily be able to show them off with a silhouette of a person perhaps holding them or in a glass globe or in a myriad of other creative options. This really is only limited by your creative thinking and I think this image style will create some of the most beautiful images of this conjunction. So finally, let's talk about narrow field imaging. Narrow field imaging is a great way to capture some wonderful detail of this event. Being able to capture the planets distinctly with moons or even surface detail will create a very unique image that won't be able to be reproduced for at least another 80 years. For this, you'll want to focus on three main things. Firstly, aperture. Use a telescope with the largest aperture you can. A telescope's aperture is the size of the primary objective or mirror in that telescope. In this case, it is 19 centimeters. In this case, it is much smaller at about six centimeters. The larger the aperture, the more detail you will be able to obtain and the brighter your image will be, which will allow you to take faster, shorter exposures and capture more of that fine detail in your final image. The second is pixel size. The smaller the pixel sizes are in your camera, the more of the detail that your telescope obtains, you'll be able to record onto your sensor. I will create a more detailed video on these two topics in the future, so make sure you're subscribed if that's something you'd like to deep dive into. But just keep in mind that if you have two cameras, using the one with the smaller pixel size will allow you to discern more fine detail within the image. Finally, there is the field of view. 
you want to make sure that you are able to fit both the planets and some moons into your image, preferably a single image, although you could absolutely do a mosaic if you so choose. At the applause of this event, the two planets will be very close and you can have as little as 10 arc minutes or 0.17 degrees field of view before clipping any of the major moons on these two planets. To calculate this, I have put a link in the description to an online field of view calculator where you can put in your telescope and the camera you are using and it will show you exactly the field of view that you want. And if you remember 0.17 degrees or 10 arc minutes, then you will be able to see how well you can frame up this image. Bear in mind that you can use focal reducers, power mates and barlows to either increase or decrease your field of view. You can also change the sensor size by using a full frame sensor. You'll get a larger field of view compared to using a crop, micro four thirds or smaller sensor size. Now let's talk about some basic camera settings that will give you a baseline to start from for this event. Planets are surprisingly bright in the sky when you're looking through a telescope. So you really don't need a long exposure for these. In fact, your exposure should be well under one second in length. I usually start at around 200 milliseconds and maybe go down to 20 milliseconds, depending on what planets they are, what telescope and magnification I am looking at. And for those of you using a DSLR, that would be from one fifth of a second down to one fiftieth of a second. Another good reason for using short exposures is that ideally you would want to actually try videoing this event rather than taking stills. The advantage of video is that you can capture as many frames as possible when you use a short exposure length. Then you can take that video, import it into a program like AutoStacker 3 or RegiStax. They will go through every single frame of that video, finding the most detailed parts of each of the planets in each of those frames and adding those detailed parts to a one to one single master image at the end. This final image then has the most detail that it can pull out from every single image in that video and it really makes a huge difference to the amount of detail in your final image. Please also make sure that if your camera can shoot in RAW, you are shooting in RAW. You want to retain as much detail as possible from these images and converting them to a lossy format like JPEG will simply make your editing of these images harder. That covers off my extensive guide to the great conjunction of 2020. I do hope you have learned something from this video or at least found it entertaining. If I am still around at the next time these planets are close together in 2080, I will definitely make sure to make another video updating you on what has changed between now and then. My name is Rowan, this is Astro with Roro, and may your skies be clear this December solstice.